All right, so we now are moving on to the final um, final topic that we're going to cover in this class. Um, and this topic is going to be us <clears throat> building a, a very simple, very rudimentary finite element uh, model from scratch. Um, we'll do this primarily in uh, probably MATLAB eventually, if you want to use something like Python, or you can do it in Mathematica too. It's all fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, but before we get into the details of how we'll kind of what's going on under the hood of, of a finite element solver, I want to first kind of remind you about why we why and when we use finite element methods in general. And so you we've introduced you all to the, the governing field equations of solid mechanics, the divergence of stress plus their body forces being equal to zero, the relationships between displacements and strains, which we saw and we primarily used in terms of the linear relationships that we did at the end of one class show that nonlinearity that can appear in the strain tensor. And we introduced uh, constitutive equations. Again, we primarily introduced constitutive equations in terms of the uh, generalized Hooke's law, which is linear, which means there's a pro linear proportionality between stress and strain. We, tr we also looked at generalized Hooke's law for orthotropic materials, also linear. But there are many, many nonlinear um, constitutive models, starting with models that are used to describe the behavior of rubber. Hooke's law does a pretty poor job at handling things like rubber, like rubber tires or balloons, or um, in which you need some sort of nonlinearity in there, or else you completely miss the, the, the physics and the behavior of those systems. Biological tissues are another one in which they'll have a really complex nonlinear material model. And the point I'm getting at is, what do you do with these equations? And there's a couple things you can do. We showed earlier in the semester that you can try to solve some of these equations by guessing the form of the solution in terms of, say, a Fourier series. And then using that, adding as many, uh, uh, many terms in the Fourier series that we need to approximate our solution. There are times when you can use other mathematical tricks. Because as I said before, these questions are partial differential, these equations are partial differential equations. Even in the linear sense, when they're linear, they are in their most general form, PDEs for three spatial variables and one time variable. Complicated. A lot of these things in real physical systems are nonlinear. We really don't know how to handle nonlinear equations. The best thing we typically do when we're trying to solve equations is make them linear, reduce their dimensionality. And that's what you're doing. Like if you think about what a lot of these methods are doing, something like a Laplace transform is taking a differential equation and turning it into a system of algebraic equations that you can solve and then go back to the, uh, to the form of the, of the differential equation that you were trying to solve in the, in the outset. Something like Fourier series are taking linear superposition. And that's what linear means. Linear means you can solve the problem in one part, solve it over here in another part, and add them together to get a final solution. But most things in life are not linear. If you like Drake and you like Beethoven, you will not enjoy their music twice as much if you listen to them both at the same time. Most things get messed up when you combine them linearly. And so what do you do? So we saw in the last couple of lectures, what we spent time doing was another technique. It wasn't Fourier series, it wasn't Laplace transforms, it was dimensional reductions and axis symmetry. Dimensional reductions taking us from 3D to 2D, 2D to 1D, removing, going from three spatial coordinates to one spatial coordinate. That allowed us to reduce the PDEs 
to ordinary differential equations, which we're really good at solving. There are many, many times, and you can look all around you, wherever you're sitting right now, at structures that lack symmetry, that lack any way to reduce the order of the problems. If you're trying to model that chair or this table or our blackboard here or this computer as I hit it, these are things that I'm not going to be able to reduce the dimensionality of, use symmetry arguments to simplify them. And so we need another way to solve these equations. And the way to do that is to discretize them and solve the equations at each point that we've discretized in our mesh. So we kind of, we turn this thing instead of being one continuous body into a discrete mesh of points connected by uh, elements. And there's basically two ways to solve uh, differential equations once you've discretized them. The simpler and faster way is what's referred to as the finite difference method. And you might have come across this in some of your other classes. Finite difference method is incredibly powerful. The challenge of the finite difference method is that it works on a regularly spaced grid, which means if I have this table here, I'm going to, to split it up in terms of uh, elements that are the same size in this direction and the same size in that direction. Which for some problems, astrophysical problems, uh, seismology problems in, uh, uh, involving um, really large scales, either dimensionally or temporally, that works fine. And for solid mechanics problems, it doesn't work at all. And the reason is, is that stress tends to concentrate in regions where uh, there are changes in geometry. So when you look back at this table, you wouldn't really want a regular mesh here because stress is going to behave differently at the corners than it's going to behave in the bulk. For most things, and if you've ever used any finite element solver before, if you've ever seen any mesh of a CAD model that you created, you probably can recall that that mesh is not uniform. Even as simple as a circular plate, which doesn't have any corners, it's how do you put a regular rectangular mesh on a circular plate? The curved boundaries break that ability to use that approach. And so we have to turn to a more robust, more powerful, and mathematically more complicated technique, which is the finite element method allows us to discretize our, our object into whatever mesh we need to get the, um, the level of convergence of a solution that we desire. I assume that you're familiar with, with aspects of, of, of the finite element method. You take an object, a CAD model, you uh, discretize it by creating a mesh, and there's lots of subtleties that go into this, meaning you get to choose what kind of elements you're connecting and, and uh, making up this, this discretized object. The simplest element is the one we're going to primarily focus on for constructing this um, kind of final element code from scratch. And that's the, the what's called the two node bar, which is simply a linear spring. It's a, literally a bar that we're going to treat like a spring and we're going to tie them together at pins. These things can get incredibly complicated. You can have elements that are plates, blocks, shell elements, all sorts of really complex 3D uh, element choices that help you uh, get around certain challenges um, with solving equations through the finite element method. So your choice of element can be incredibly complex. Our goal here is not to teach you a class on how to use the finite element method. It's to give you an idea of what's going on under the hood. So that way, if you either go on further and take a course on finite element modeling, you'll have some grounding and traction for how to, how to handle that content. Or if you never take another course on finite element modeling again, but you do end up using CAD models and finite element models in your, in your career going forward, instead of it feeling like a black box, you'll have some idea of what's going on under, underneath the hood. And that's the goal of, of this, is just to kind of introduce you to 
a what is happening when we try to solve equations um, by solving them over a discretized uh, mesh for an object. So we're going to do everything using a two node bar as our element. And that two node bar can be represented two nodes, our bar, and you can really just conceptually think of this as a spring. There are some terms and terminology we're gonna use repeatedly. For instance, if I have a truss that looks like this, then we're gonna use the, the terminology that these little dots here are our joints. These things are our members. We could choose for that. The reason why I'm not calling that member, my two node bar is because we could take the same truss and we could model it with a different element there. We could model it with a, a bar element or a beam element or a frame element. And the shape of the object would look the same, but the physics that we're trying to capture would look different. And we'll talk more about that. And these are our supports. So the procedure we're gonna use here is what's referred to as, um, maybe I'll pull this up. I don't know, I can, I can write it down here. The procedure we're gonna use is what's referred to as the direct stiffness method. As you're gonna see, we're gonna develop equations that relate the forces at each joint to the displacements at each joint through a stiffness matrix. This method is a way where we directly calculate the stiffness method, uh, stiffness matrix. If you were to go and work in a, at a master's or PhD level program where you're working with people who are doing serious finite element uh, models, you're not gonna start with the direct stiffness me uh, method as your way of creating your, your final element model. And the reason being is that for really complex systems, full 3D objects, nonlinear complex contingent models, maybe additional physics, like maybe you wanna have some electromagnetic fields, some, some swelling or fluid structure interactions, De deriving the stiffness matrix in those complicated multi-physics problems is incredibly complex and we yield thousands of lines of code. In general, what you'll do is something that you already know how to do, which is that you'll write down the governing equations to your problem and derive the weak form. And remember, deriving the weak form of your equations is done by calculating the first variation of your total potential energy. So in general, if you're gonna go and do final element modeling on a real um, uh, like research level uh, laboratory, something like what uh, Professor Park, or Professor Barboni is doing, Professor Lejeune, you're gonna bypass, you're gonna use a different method for deriving your, the equations that you're solving. This is a really straightforward way for you to kind of see, even regardless of how you get to the stiffness matrix, the way you're solving it is really similar to what we're gonna be talking about here. And this helps kind of illustrate the problem. And there's a couple of steps that we're gonna use in, in, this, um, in this process. The first is we're gonna idealize the structure. <laughs> 
which really is just saying we're going to replace the physical structure with a mathematical model. And things at this point, we're going to start to make approximations. And our approximations are kind of tied to our choices of elements. If we choose a two node bar, what we're saying is that the elements that make up these members here can only withstand compression and tension. Because that's all that a spring can do. If I have a spring, if that's a spring, it can only stretch and, and compress. If I want something that's able to deflect and bend, I would need to use a, a beam element. If I need something that's going to be able to stretch and compress and bend, I'd use something called a frame element, in which you're kind of combining the physics of, of, a, of a linear spring and something that's uh, able to resist deflection. We're going to start with this shape here. Because I think it's probably the simplest truss that we can cook up. And we're going to uh, derive a, a, a model for this, um, for this structure here. It's going to be, once we derive this, it'll be, we can pick any truss that we want and we'll be able to solve it um, using the same code that we will we'll be writing. The second step is going to be we're going to break down or disassemble our structure. The goal of this step is to calculate the stiffness matrix for each element. And the third step is going to be an assembly step or merger. And the goal of this step is to add the individual or what we'll refer to as the local stiffness matrices to the global stiffness matrix. Then we'll apply our boundary conditions. And we're going to solve a very simple equation, a spring equation, F equals KU. F is your force vector. In this case, these are all going to be a vector, tensor, a vector, such that we're going to be have all the forces that could be occurring at all the nodes of your truss being related to all the displacements of all the nodes of your truss related by this global stiffness matrix, which is, where do I write that? Global stiffness matrix. And that is this thing. The direct stiffness method means we're going to be kind of going through the structure, calculating the local stiffness matrix for each element, and then adding that to the global stiffness matrix and calculating the, direct, the global stiffness matrix directly. I should probably rearrange this. I'm going to do that now. This, this is really what comes first. Um, Okay, so this is the approach we're going to take. 
And I'm going to take this thing here and, and, ex and expand it. So we can write all over it here. We're going to have a very simple truss. It's a planar truss, so it's only a 2D. It has joints that we're going to number. I'll number these in purple. One. So we're all on the same page here. I'm going to try to number, number them the same. One, two, and three. We'll label all the elements, I'll write them in blue and I'll put them with parentheses around them. This is going to be element one, oops, element two, and element three. We're going to have a couple of coordinate systems that we're going to have to keep track of here. We're going to start with what we're going to refer to as the global coordinate system. Now, we could choose to put this wherever we want, whatever orientation we want. I'm going to choose to put it down here at node one. And we'll call this Y and this X. So this is the coordinate system of the structure. Now, each element, of course, could have its own various properties that we should probably be keeping track of. And so by that, I mean, we could have an elastic modulus of each element. Elastic modulus of element one, of element two, of element three. We could have a length that we can calculate for each element, length one, length two, length three, and a cross-sectional area of each element. Oops, that's not an A. I'll write these so that we can write them in a general form like this. As E to the little e. Doesn't look like an e. L, each element, A, each element. So this is the idealizing of the structure. Here we're, we're taking that trust and we're starting to apply kind of labels and ways to keep track of all the various geometric and material components and their locations in space. Now, hopefully you recall from statics that a pin jointed truss can only withstand forces and reactions at the joints. And we're gonna use that to our advantage here. And our goal is to analyze the forces and displacements at each joint. So we really are going to be working on, let's see here, analyze Our object is, as we've said, a planar truss. So we would expect that the axial components of these forces will have components of force in the X 
and y direction. And our displacements Again, we'll have displacements in the X and Y direction. As you can see from this, each joint or node has two degrees of freedom. It can move in X, it can move in Y. We're gonna pretend there's no Z. So we need a way to keep track of what the components are at each joint. And so if we have three joints, we could call it, we could say we have I joints. I can be one to whatever. And we would say that in order to keep track of that, I would have Fx I and Fx, I'm oh, sorry, Fy I. And similarly, Uxi, Uyi, meaning that Fx1 would be the force in the x direction at joint one. Uy3 is going to be the displacement in the y direction of joint three. And we can stick all those into a really long column vector. Which we would say Fx1, Fy1, that's triple x, And similarly, we can write out a long displacement vector, which is going to look very similar. This is the number of degrees of freedom in your problem, the length of this vector, how many degrees of freedom your system has. This is actually an important thing for us to be keeping track of. So we're going to be talking, we're going to come back to this idea of how many degrees of freedom does your system have? And these are also the state variables, which means you're, this is typically, the state variables are, you know, in the context of energy methods, the state variables are what you're minimizing your energy with respect to. If we are doing analytical mechanics, which is what we were doing last week or last class and the last one before that, and which are on pen and paper, trying to derive the solution to a problem, we are often considering the boundary conditions kind of at the start. They're in our head about how we should handle uh, this problem. In computational mechanics, the boundary conditions are essentially added in at the end of the problem. You kind of set up your problem as if you have in a general way in which you're no real restrictions or constraints on your degrees of freedom. And then you apply your, your uh, kinematic boundary conditions, which are restrictions on displacement, and your natural boundary conditions, which are statements of, of, of where forces are in what direction. Okay. So here's where it starts to get a little bit messy because I can say, well, let's take my my force vector and we know it's going to be related to my displacement vector. 
with a really large master stiffness matrix. This generally is referred to as K, it's two dimensions. And you can start to fill this out. I'm not going to fill the whole thing out because it's a bit tedious, but you can think okay, this first term should be K, X1, X1, K, X1, Y1. K X one X two. I probably didn't give myself enough space here. K X one Y two. K oops. X one X three. Almost. K, X, 1, Y, 3. And you can kind of continue imagine filling this thing out. This would be Y, 1, Y, 1. X, 2, X, 2. Y, 2, Y, 2. Did I give myself enough room there? Those of you writing on pen and paper, apologies. And you can imagine how this thing would fill out. This matrix is going to be symmetric. And the entries to this thing are what's referred to as your stiffness coefficients. So let me highlight one of these. So oops, that's a terrible color. Let's go over here. So this is what's referred to as a These things have a physical interpretation. They help you relate the forces and displacements at one node to the deformation. So let's say the forces at one node to the displacement at one node is going to be dictated by how stiff that particular element is in that direction. So it's like you have a you have springs resisting deformation in X and Y directions. That's going to depend on the material properties of the element, the cross sectional area of the element, the length of the element. And if you apply a force at one joint in one direction, so you apply like F X one, then you can calculate if you want to know what the displacement of U y1 is going to be or ux1 then you're going to look at the kind of stiffness that is telling you how that force is going to cause a displacement of that joint so these things even though that seems kind of messy and and just like a mathematical entity it's a it has a physical interpretation relating the force at a joint to the displacement of the joint in particular the force in a direction at a joint to the displacement in that direction at that joint You can start to see why we, as mechanicians, use compact notation to write down our equations, because it's much nicer to write this equation as F equals K U. Or making that closer together. This is the equation we're trying to solve. 
And it just so happens that F is a vector and U is a vector and K is a matrix. But this is what we're trying to solve. It's a matrix equation. Okay, questions. I know I'm just delineating definitions here, but these are important because as we start to get into the details, if this stuff isn't making sense, then what we're going to talk about later is not going to make any sense. The important thing to know is that we're talking about the entire structure here. These are all the possible forces. There's only two directions, X and Y. So each joint can only have a force in either the X or Y direction. So there are three joints, two directions. There should be six degrees of freedom. There are six degrees of freedom over here. So these six force vector uh, components of the forces are going to cause displacements in these six directions. And the way that those forces induce those displacements is going to be dictated by kind of how stiff the element is that's trying to be deformed. This is all in terms of this is all part of the idealization of our structure and breaking it down into something that we can create a mathematical object for, a mathematical model for. And so this is how we've idealized it. And everything here is written in terms of the global coordinate system, which means X and Y have a particular meaning. Y is vertical, X is horizontal both starting at node one, X running in the positive direction to the right, Y running in the positive direction vertically. We're, I'm specifically going to write our coordinate system and our forces and displacements and our stiffness components when we're in the global coordinate system like this, no decorations to these letters at all. What we're going to do next, as we break this structure apart into individual components, is introduce a local coordinate system for each element. And we're going to write those forces and displacements and stiffness components with a bar over the top of them. We're going to write the coordinate system not as X and Y, but as X bar and Y bar to denote that we're, everything we're going to talk about next is going to be in a local coordinate system, one that is relative to the element that we're looking at. <clears throat> so let me show you what that means. So everything here is global. Everything here is talking about the structure. Now let me show you what, we, what it means when we look at uh, breaking this thing down. Uh, I should have written up here that we're... <laughs> Okay. Now that we've idealized our, our trust <clears throat> as something that we can identify as particular degrees of freedom, forces, displacements, stiffness uh, components. Now what we'd like to do is take it, let's see if I can grab it over here. And we want to break this thing apart. And what I mean by that is, is we want to take this and you can imagine like separating the nodes so that each element has two nodes. Right now in the idealized structure, elements are sharing nodes. So element one and element three are sharing node one. But what we're going to do now is split this up so that each element has its own two nodes. So we would say, okay, I've got element three here, element one, and element two. <clears throat> Just to be clear, one, two, and three. 
actually going to move this guy right here. And now we can give each element its own coordinate system. And what we're going to do to give each element its own coordinate system is we're going to make sure that for each coordinate system, the x-axis runs along the, the bar and the y-axis is normal to the bar. So for instance, I can have a coordinate system for this one here. It's going to be x bar one, y bar one. I can have a coordinate system for this one here. It's going to be x bar two, y bar two. I should probably not write them sideways, huh? That's, that's annoying. Let's try that again. And over here, x bar three, y bar three. So now we have three coordinate systems, one for each element. And you'll notice that each one has a bar over it indicating it's a local coordinate system. And each one has a number near it telling you which element or member telling you which member that coordinate system is referring to. So our local coordinate systems we could write as it's going to be an x bar e and a y bar e. And our goal with this is, remember, let's go back for a second. Our goal here is to calculate the stiffness matrix for each element. And what do I mean by that? And what I mean is, well, if I take an individual element isolated in space, it has two nodes, I could apply forces to those nodes. Which are going to cause a displacement. And that displacement is going to be dictated by the stiffness of that element. So again, I can solve an equation that's going to be F equals KU, except in this case, it's just going to be the forces on one element will tell me what the, displaces of, the displacements of that element are, which are going to be related by the stiffness matrix of that element. That's what we're going to refer to as the local stiffness matrix, the stiffness matrix of a particular element in our system. So let's come down here and grab a generic element. And so for that generic trust member, we can call this node or joint I, node J, We know already that we're going to have a coordinate system that looks like this. X bar. Y bar. And we can write our forces and our displacements as, here we go, 
I could have a force here that I'm just drawing an arbitrary positive force. We know that that's in the X direction. We'll call it FX I. I'm gonna put a bar over it because this is a local force vector. F X J. We can also have forces in the Y direction. Although as we'll see in a moment, these are really unnecessary because our element that we've chosen can't withstand any forces in the Y direction. But we'll write this out to be complete. So those are my four forces. I'll copy this and paste it so that way I don't just make a mess here. Because what I'd like to do, oh no. Is also mark the fact that we could have displacements in all these different directions. So this could cause a displacement in the U bar XI, U bar XJ, So there are four joint force components, one, two, three, four. And there are four joint displacement components, one, two, three, four. These four joint displacement components are the degrees of freedom for this uh, particular member. Now it's helpful to take a second and remember that our element that we've chosen the two node bar, which is physically a linear spring. Okay, what does that mean? It means we should really think of it as I have some spring. The length L with some spring stiffness. K S, and then if I pull on this thing, I get a displacement. So I'll put some forces on here. So this is negative F, this is positive F. I think one of the things that is always tricky for people is to sort of connect springs to actual physical real materials that we are working on. I'll just remind, I'll just point out that our spring stiffness KS is equal to stuff that we're more comfortable with. It's equal to the Young's elastic modulus times the cross-sectional area of this bar over the length. This is important. We're gonna have different we're gonna be able to derive something like this for um a bending rigidity and saying, oh, there's a bending kind of resistance here, which is going to be related to EI over L, well, you'll find out it's L cubed. But the idea is that we can connect these kind of local kind of spring uh, uh, approximations to the material properties that we're more used to.
Okay, so this is a simpler system. Once again, we're going to try to solve the same system of equations, which is f in local coordinates for a given element is equal to k in local coordinates for a given element times u in local coordinates for a given element. And this is simpler. We can write all this out. We're going to have, we have four force vectors. So f x i, f y i, f x j, f y j. This is going to be equal to our a local stiffness matrix. This is the stiffness matrix for this particular member. We'll write all this out. <clears throat> it's going to be K bar for this element. Oh, I should have put E's on all those. Sorry. E, E, E. So we're going to have K, E. X i x i but And we can fill this thing out. I suppose we should. Sorry, everybody. Let's take a two minute break. I have to take this call. All right. Sorry about that. Hopefully, you filled out the rest of this sparse matrix without my help. But if not, we can get back into it. Um, so, remember what we're doing? We're trying to write out the F equals KU for this particular uh, individual element. And so we can kind of go over here at one, one, j, oops, it's actually x, i, no, it's not. All right, and then we have our displacement vector, which isn't too bad, X. Y. Okay. All right, and now this is the system of equations we're looking to solve. 
Now we know how linear springs behave. We know that a linear spring goes with the relationship that the force in the spring is equal to the spring stiffness times the displacement of the string, which we now know. Uh, I should have probably written that as displacement. I'm going to write this as kind of like a generic. Oops, I'm going to write that as a displacement term instead of u. And I'll show you why in a second. So we'll call that in terms of displacement. And we'll relate d as our displacement to our, our individual displacements of the particular nodes. But we know that this is equal to EA over L times D, and that's from here. We also know that from a force balance, that the force in the XJ direction has to be equal and opposite to the force in the XI direction. Uh, sorry, everybody. Um, Wrapping one second, it should be really quick. All right, let's try to wrap this thing up. Um, where are we? We have this equation we want to solve. We don't know how to solve this equation yet because we don't know what these things are. We generally know this, and we know well, we generally know some of these and some of these, and we know none of these in purple. And our goal is to split up this thing into individual members and find these Ks for the, each individual member, convert them to the right coordinate system. So right now they're all in this coordinate system or this one or this one. And we'd like to convert them to this coordinate system. Once we do that conversion, we can insert them into here. And that's the procedure we're after. And it's easier to see that procedure if we simply look at one of these in kind of this uh, current flat configuration here. We'll account for the angled one in a second. And so what do we know? We know that from a force balance, what do we got here? So we know from a force balance that there should be no forces in the y direction. Because this is a spring. Springs can't bear any load in the, in the y direction. So we're only going to be left with forces in xi and xj. And we know that the forces in xi and xj have to be equal and opposite, such that the force in xj has to be equal to an opposite of the force in xi. Opposite j. Let's try that again. And the reason why I wrote this with a little d here instead of a u is because the actual displacement is going to be the difference in u that the, of the in the displacement of each node in the x direction. So what I mean by that is, so our kinematic equations. Are such that the displacement of my spring is going to be equal to the location of the node J. Oops. Oops. In local coordinates, minus the displacement of I in local coordinates. Again, we're not expecting there to be any displacements in Y. This is a spring it can stretch and compress in, in the plane. And we can write this as a, a set of matrix equations by kind of taking this, putting it in here, such that we can take our force vector. Actually, I'll take the force vector and the equal sign. 
then we can say that this is going to equal my stiffness matrix. Now we know now that our stiffness matrix is going to be this quantity right here. For each element. And so we can write this as well, the x one direction is going to be related to the displacement in that direction by EA over L. Adding those little E's there. There should be no y displacements. The next entry in this matrix is going to be zero. We know the forces have to be equal and opposite. And so if this is positive, then this one, which is relating the force into this direction, should be negative. And again, we're going to expect no displacement in the y direction. Take a second and see if you can fill out the remainder of this uh, stiffness matrix. If you know that the forces in the y direction are zero, you probably could quickly put together that the second and the fourth row of this matrix should be all zeros. And again, we know that the displacements in the y direction should be zero, so we should be able to pick out that this is zero. And this is zero. What are the other two entries? Yeah, exactly. It's the same ones. You just flip the order. So the first one will be negative. It's going to be negative E A over L, and then now this one's going to be positive. So this is true when the local coordinate system is aligned with the global coordinate system. And recall that our local coordinate system was drawn with the x horizontally and the y vertically. And what we would like to be able to do is to be able to get this. This is what's referred to as the, as the local, the member stiffness matrix. And we're going to call this 
K-E, K-bar E. We want to get K-bar E for every, I mean, I guess I should say this a different way. This is a, this is, this is, you can ignore. I should, I'm going to erase this now. This is actually not right. This is true always. Sorry, everyone. This is true always. However, our, we have, what we have to do is take this K bar E and transform it to a K E. What I mean by that is we currently have, oops, we currently have the local stiffness matrix in, we have the member stiffness matrix in local coordinates. In order to add this to the global stiffness matrix, we have to take the local stiffness matrix and transform it to that coordinate system of the global stiffness matrix. Meaning if this thing was like, I'm gonna take this guy over here, copy, ah. Meaning if I was taking this thing, and now it's rotated, my stiffness matrix in the local coordinate system doesn't really care about this angle. But now if I'm going to take this and insert it into my master stiffness matrix, I need to replace, I need to transform the, co the components, which means the entries of this matrix. I need to transform these into the coordinate system of the overall structure. I'm going to pause here for some questions because I think this is a point where people can get confused. So how are we doing? The nice thing is like, this is where the physics is. The physics is here. So what I mean by that is, and I should do that on here. What I mean by that is, is that if we were to, to take this thing and say, oh, I want to account for bending. We would be doing it here at the local level in the local coordinate system. I want to account for bending, I want to account for transverse shear, I want to account for torsion. We're doing it all here, we're saying this member if it uh, resists torque in this way and bending in this way, it's all going to populate this elemental stiffness matrix here. And then our next step is transforming that into the global coordinate system. You'll often see this written more compactly as this. And if you're coding this in MATLAB, if this is a cleaner way to do it, you're going to probably just pull out that and have it multiply a nice matrix of ones and zeros. Oops. So that's the way you'll more commonly see it. And so this is now the next step is how do we transform our local coordinate stiffness matrix into our global coordinate one. 
Do we have time, I think, to do this for one of them? We'll do this for um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to we're going to say how do, how does We're going to transform from local to global coordinate systems. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to transform the force vectors and the displacement vectors. So we need to take U bar and map it to U and F bar and map it to F, meaning what are the displacements in the global coordinate system? What are the forces in the global coordinate system? And we're pretty good at this because we've been doing transformations of stress for a while. And it's the same stuff. This is the same ideas. There's, there's not much that we have to worry about here. We're going to take, I'm going to take this thing here. We'll start with our displacements. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to make it bigger and I'm going to rotate it. So that's some arbitrary element at some arbitrary angle. And we're going to denote that. We're going to say, okay, well, let's see what's happening here. This is my rotation here. Uh, we'll call this theta. And what am I rotating with respect to? We're rotating with respect to the global coordinate system, which is X and Y. And if we're talking about things in X or Y, then I would expect that there should be some component of this thing here. Let's zoom in so I can draw this a little bit better component here, which is going to be u, x, j. And now note that I'm not putting a u bar here because this is aligned with the right with the global coordinate system. And I'll have a u y j. And over here just the same. I'll have a u y i and a u x i. We need to know what our force vectors and our displacement vectors are in the coordinate system of the structure. So that way we can take the stiffness matrix in the co coordinate system of the structure, add it to the global stiffness matrix. Theta here is our angle the angle between x bar and x. And we're pretty good at this by now, I hope. We 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 would say that, okay. My displacement transformations. We're not going to be able to finish this today. We'll do displacements today. We'll come back and do forces on Tuesday, and then we'll transform the global stiffness matrix K on, on Tuesday as well, using some things from, from linear algebra to help us. But we can do this pretty quickly just so you can get a sense of what's happening by just looking at the displacements. Because we would say, hey, look, my, my new coordinate, so X, my displacement in the local coordinates, U, X, I, can be decomposed into the components in the global system, U, X, I, U, Y, I, 
times sines and cosines of their angles, right? So this is going to be something like ux i times the cosine of theta plus u y i times the sine of theta. And do this again for yi. This one's flipped minus uxi. This is all just coming from rotation matrices. This is all just saying, okay, rotate. You have your kind of u, uh, the new u is equal to the rotation matrix times the old u times the transpose of the rotation matrix, which is, if you recall, you're going to have your cosine, cosine, sine, negative sine. And so this is all we're doing here is again, it's just friendly old linear algebra. This is the same as the one above it. Except we're replacing i's with j's. And this is the same as the second line. Again, replacing i's with j's. And you might notice that like, hey, wait a minute, I have on the left hand side here, I have some four equations for my four components of my displacement vector. And on the right hand side, I have one, ah, come on. one, two, three, four. So we have u bars equal to u's times some cosines and sines of thetas. We should be able to write this as a kind of system of matrix equations or meaning we can take this and write it more I don't know if it's necessarily more compact, but we can write it like this such that u bar xi for the element is equal to, actually, I'm going to pull that element thing outside. I'll show you what I mean in a second. u bar yi, u bar xj, u bar yj. I'll say these are all referring to a particular element. This will be related to Again, this is going to be like our rotation matrix, except it's going to be, instead of it being a two by two rotation matrix, it's got to be a four by four rotation matrix. And you'll notice that uxj doesn't appear in these equations. uyj doesn't appear in these equations. Sorry, always pointing at the screen here. uxj doesn't appear in this equation. uxyj doesn't appear in this equation. And similarly, uxi doesn't appear in this equation, this thing here. So you're going to have something where if you let me write this as little c and this as little s, so cosine theta is just c and sine theta is just s, I can write this really compactly as c, s, 0, 0, negative s, C, zero, 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 C, S, S, C, F. And look, this is, this is familiar to us, right? This is 
this little subcomponent here, like this little box here, we know what that is. That's our rotation matrix, Q. So is the one down below, it's Q. Exact same stuff. When we talk about how general stress transformation is, these are this, this is the rotation matrix. We end up with a four by four rotation matrix so that we can rotate all the components of our displacement vector. But this is just more linear algebra. This is all the stuff that we know how to do. All we're doing is trying to transform all of the forces, displacements, and stiffnesses from their local coordinates to their global ones. And I'm missing one thing. The thing I'm missing is that this should be giving us ah, our displacements in the real global coordinate system. I point this out just so you can kind of, again, see the importance in like all of the times when you have to transform between one system and another. It keeps coming up and up again. So we've got to do this again. We have to do this for force. We'll do that on Tuesday. Once we have the forces in our global system and our displacements in our global system, we can do a little bit more linear algebra to determine what the stiffness matrix is in our global coordinate system. And then we're in a position to add that stiffness matrix to our master stiffness matrix. And then we're kind of done. We need to write a little algorithm in MATLAB to help us kind of do that for however many nodes we have, however many elements we have. But then we're at a point where we can, all we are trying to do, and I'm gonna wrap up with this, all we're trying to do is solve this system of equations, F equals KU for my entire structure. And generally, you know some of the force vectors, meaning there's a applied force at node three coming at this angle. I can decompose that to a force at node three in the X and the Y direction. And you might also know something about the displacement. So in this case, we might say, hey, there can't be any displacement in X or Y at joint one, but joint two is on a roller, so it's free to move in X, but it's not free to move in Y. So we know that U, for joint one in X and Y have to be zero, and U for joint two in Y has to be zero. So we know some things about F, we know some things about uh, U. We're using geometry and force balances to find our stiffness matrix. We're transforming that stiffness matrix into our global coordinate system so that we're actually looking at it like a structure. And so then we're going to populate that big matrix up here, Q, with all these types of, it's going to look like this. Isn't it? All of these are going to go in here, but they're going to have some sines and cosines in here. And then we're going to have a system of equations in which we have for some known forces, some known displacements, an entirely filled out stiffness matrix. And then we're going to be solving. And what are we solving for? We're solving for two things. We're solving for all the unknown forces. What are those physically? The unknown forces are your reaction forces. And we're solving for our unknown displacements, which obviously those are just the displacements of the truss that we don't know. And that's how we are going to solve this system. So we're partway there. And we'll continue plugging away at this on Tuesday. Thanks, everyone.